The Lost World is a science fiction adventure novel written in 1912 by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle that details the adventures of four men who travel deep into the Amazon jungle in search of a plateau that's only been charted by few, none of which were alive to tell the tale. However, with evidence of grand discoveries, our four characters are set on exploring this plateau, but things don't go as planned when they realize this land is home to ancient and deadly animals. The novel would end up becoming one of, if not the most influential piece of paleo media as for decades after its release, people would adapt and retell Doyle's story countless times. And today, I want to explore the world of those many different adaptations and retellings. But before we get started though, as always, I want to thank you for supporting the channel. In case you didn't see the last video, I announced the start of my Patreon page, and I just want to take this time to thank everyone who subscribed to it. Don't worry, I plan to do a proper thank you at the end of the video, but given this is the first video after that announcement, announcement, I figured it was worth mentioning. That, and, you know, showing people that I have a Patreon page in case they want to support the channel in other ways while finding extra content to watch. You can always subscribe to my Patreon for $3 a month. If you do, you get all these cool perks. Thank you for listening, let's get back to the video. Anyways, like I said earlier, the book was written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who, before The Lost World, would focus his time studying the medical field and training to be a doctor. As far as writing went, Doyle would write several short stories throughout the 1880s, but it wasn't until 1887 where he would create one of his first published novels called A Study in Scarlet, which was also his first Sherlock Holmes book. The invention of Sherlock Holmes is what Doyle would end up becoming most well-known for as the Holmes character character would become his most popular character, and one of the ones in general that would experience the most iterations in media. Doyle would go on to make around 300 stories, most of them being short stories, but 24 of them would be full-on novels. Sherlock Holmes appeared in many of them, much to Doyle's eventual dismay. At some point down the line, he grew tired of the Holmes character and even attempted to kill him off only to bring him back by popular demand. It wouldn't be a surprise that Doyle would look to create a different story, one of a different nature for a different crowd, one that would get him away from his overload of Sherlock Holmes and explore different areas of writing. This would be the birth of 1912's The Lost World. I think for us to fully understand these different adaptations, it's good to go through the source material first. The story focuses on Edward Malone, a young reporter who's looking to start his life with his lady friend, Gladys Hungerton. Unfortunately for Malone, that's all Gladys wants to be, just friends. Unless, of course, Malone is willing to change his safe way of life and take on more dangerous opportunities so that Gladys, as she puts it, can be envied for her man. Basically, she wants a man that could look death in the eyes and not shit his pants, and Malone, like a true simp, gives in to this request, and uses his job, a news publication company called the Daily Gazette, to acquire a dangerous assignment so that he can prove himself to his not-girlfriend. While there's not really anything available that he's looking for, Malone's boss instead assigns him to cover a scandal involving the infamous George Edward Challenger, a contentious and short-tempered zoologist who came back from a trip to South America a couple of years prior with a vague tale of what he had seen during his expedition. Fun fact, the Challenger character is based off of one of Doyle's previous real-life professors, William Rutherford. In the book, many see Challenger as a liar and a fraud, and Malone's boss wants him to find out more about this story to expose the professor for exactly that. But of course, there's one problem. Challenger hates journalists, and the topic of South America is a touchy one for him. However, Malone is able to secure a meeting with the professor at his house after posing as a student in need of guidance. But the professor is able to see right through this lie, and this leads to a small scuffle as Challenger literally physically assaults people who see him as a liar, or, in this case, attempt to expose him as a liar. The fight is taken to the streets where they're broken up by a nearby policeman. Despite the professor having a reputation of fighting with reporters like this, Malone takes the blame for causing the scuffle. Seeing this, the professor decides to give Malone a chance and fills him in on the information regarding his South American expedition. Here, the professor explains to Malone what had happened. Initially, Challenger had gone to South America to study some of the fauna in an unexplored area. 
On his return trip, he stopped by a native village who were familiar with the professor due to his medical abilities. The natives seemed distressed and escorted the professor to a hut in which a European man lay dead in. Along with the body was a knapsack which contained evidence of who the man was and what he was doing in South America. The man was named Maple White, and through his sketches, it was clear that the explorer had traveled to the top of a once uncharted plateau and encountered prehistoric animals on it. Interested, Challenger went back to where White had come from and managed to find the plateau. It was there the professor would encounter a large reptilian animal, a pterosaur to be more specific, which he was able to get a picture of and even shot it down. Unfortunately, due to a boating accident, Challenger lost his specimen along with several other of his photographs. However, some of the evidence was salvageable, but not enough to prove his account. The professor has to give a lecture that night at the Zoological Institute Hall, where he intends to talk a little bit more about the topic in the hopes of finding more people interested in it, and Malone is invited. Later that night, during the lecture, we meet Professor Summerlee, one of Challenger's rivals who sees his story of prehistoric animals as nothing but a fake account. But the bickering between the two professors leads to Summerlee wanting to take an expedition to the location himself to prove Challenger wrong. Challenger accepts, but wants the old Summerlee to be accompanied by people who are more physically capable and asks for volunteers in the crowd. Here, we meet Lord John Roxton, known for being a sportsman and a traveler, who volunteers to escort Summerlee and is accepted. Malone, deciding to use this opportunity to face possible danger so that he can prove himself to Gladys, also volunteers and is accepted. With that, the four make their way to South America following the coordinates and path left behind by Maple White in their search for the plateau. Along the way, they also acquire helping hands, including Zambo, a large and strong black man who's literally described as a Black Hercules, along with one or two other descriptions that I won't say, but are what some would probably call based nowadays. Relax, the story was a product of its time, and everything I'm saying regarding how it portrays people of color are all jokes. Then there's also a couple of other helpers named Gomez and Manuel, who our main characters describe as half-breeds. Though a long and tiresome journey, the men are able to find the plateau and make camp at the base, where they get their first real look at prehistoric life. As they sit around a fire that night cooking an animal that Roxton had shot, a pterosaur swoops in from the night and steals the kill, officially proving Challenger's case to be true. But that doesn't stop the group from trying to make their way to the top of the plateau. The cliffs of the plateau itself are too difficult to climb up on, so the group resorts to using a rock structure that stands next to the region that is climbable. On top of that structure is a tree that they're able to cut down and use as a bridge to get to the top. When our four main explorers are across, they turn around only to see the tree bridge had purposely been pushed off the edge by Gomez and Manuel, causing our characters to be stuck on the plateau. Turns out, Gomez was the brother of a slaver that Roxton had killed during a previous conflict that he was a part of in the Amazon. Gomez and Manuel attempt to make their escape, but Roxton is able to shoot Gomez from the right angle, sending the man to fall the rest of the way down the cliff. Manuel makes it to the bottom but is chased and killed by Zambo. With our characters stuck on the plateau, they take their time to explore the region and find a place to make camp. During their time in this strange new place, they run into all sorts of prehistoric animals. They run into iguanodons eating peacefully by a glade. They're attacked by a flock of pterodactyls with venomous bites. One night, they're approached by a large theropod dinosaur of some kind, possibly a megalosaurus or an allosaurus, that Roxton is able to chase off with a torch. Despite the dangers, the group explore what they can of the land. The two professors seem to bicker at just about anything, whether it's them trying to classify whatever new creature they run into, or them trying to figure out how they're going to get back to level ground. At one point, Roxton notices the soil in certain areas of the plateau that have a clay bluish look to them that seems to interest him. And one night, after Malone is able to prove himself useful to the group by climbing up a tree to scout the top of the region, he feels confident enough to sneak away to take a late evening walk to the central lake that he managed to spot in the hopes of getting a head start to explore it for his friends. He follows a stream near the camp that leads down to the lake where he encounters a stegosaurus, though he's able to avoid any real confrontation. The same could not be said about the theropod he runs into on his way back home. 
In his attempt to get away from the carnivorous dinosaur, he falls into a pit that's revealed to be a trap as there are man-made spikes protruding from the ground, meant to impale anything that falls into the crevice. Before attempting to climb out, Malone waits a while just in case the carnivore was still out there. Eventually, he climbs out of the pit and makes it back to the camp. At this point, it's already morning, but Malone is shocked to see that his colleagues had disappeared, leaving behind evidence of a struggle. A ruined camp, rifles have been left behind, and a pool of blood. Not wanting to leave the camp in case they happen to come back, Malone stays around the area. One morning, Malone is awoken by Roxton, but before he had any time to be happy that at least one of his friends were alive, Malone is told to grab what they can of their weapons and food and the two run away from the camp. Roxton fills Malone in on what happened during his late evening stroll. That morning, the three men had been attacked by a group of eight men that took them back to their own area of the plateau. There, Roxton, Summerlee, and Challenger see captured natives from a tribe that also lives on the plateau and seems to be at war with the ape men. Roxton was able to escape, but now with Malone, the two head back and rush the ape men with their guns before they're able to kill Summerlee. Luckily, they're able to scare off the tribe and save their friends along with a few natives as well who are grateful for their heroes and lead them to the other side of the plateau where the rest of their tribe inhabits. The tribe is welcoming of our characters, and the two groups team up and fight off the eight men, defeating them once and for all. For a little while after that, our characters stay with the tribe and learn more about the plateau and the animals on it. They learn that iguanodons serve as cattle to the natives, they encounter plesiosaurs in the lake, and are chased by a large prehistoric Cenozoic bird. During their time here, Challenger also has Roxton attempt to go and capture him a pterodactyl. Sometime later, Malone is approached by one of the natives that he helped save during their first attack against the ape men. The native would give him a piece of tree bark with some markings on it, a series of lines adjacent to each other with one of them having an X at the bottom of it. When Malone shows the rest of his colleagues, it's concluded that the lines represent the cave systems and the X must represent the one that leads to the way out. After exploring the selected cave, sure enough, they're able to find a way through an exit point that gets them closer to the ground. With a little bit of rope and time, our characters finally make it to level ground and out of the lost world. Back home in London, the group set up a public meeting to show the still skeptical audience a major piece of evidence of their accounts in the form of a pterodactyl that Roxton had captured for Challenger earlier in the story. The pterosaur manages to escape the building and is sighted flying southwest, likely back to its home on the South American Plateau. Challenger is finally vindicated and Malone reunites with Gladys, only to find out she moved on from both her fantasies of a brave man and Malone himself, and ended up marrying a clerk in his absence. The story ends with a final scene of our four main characters having dinner at Roxton's house. The sportsman reveals that his interest in the bluish clay soil from earlier was because the material actually contained diamonds in it, which he managed to bring home about 200,000 pounds UK currency worth of, and he decides to share his fortune with his colleagues. Challenger decides to use his share to open his own private museum. Summerlee decides to use his share to retire and study fossils. And Roxton and Malone decide to use their fortune to go back to the Lost World in the hopes of learning more about it. And that was 1912's The Lost World. This was the source material that many had to work with when it came to the many adaptations and, in other cases, continuations, inspirations, and even parodies. The world of Lost World adaptations is very much a crazy one to follow, and there are lots of examples, so with that, let's take a look at them. The Lost World 1925 1925's The Lost World is the first feature-length dinosaur movie to ever be created and one that used the method of stop motion to give life to its dinosaurs. And of course, it was the first adaptation to Doyle's novel. Willis O'Brien would be hired by Watterson R. Rothacker, who initially worked on making advertising an industrial film. Rothacker would obtain the options to adapt Arthur Conan Doyle's book into a movie, and after seeing O'Brien's stop motion animations from The Ghost of Slumber Mountain, he wanted him on board. O'Brien would then hire artist Marcel Delgado to make the dinosaur models for the film, which were based off of Charles R. Knight paintings. And of course, Harry O. Hoyt was also brought into the project as a director. The movie would be in pre-production for about two years due to all of the work that went into these models, and the end product shows, especially for its time. Finally, in February of 1925, the movie would be released, a movie that no one had ever experienced before. 
For the time, the effects were revolutionary, the dinosaurs were so real, and the adventure was no doubt grand. However, in terms of adaptations, the Lost World movie was not completely faithful to the book, but that's not a testament to its quality. While the book and the movie at their core are essentially the same story, the movie unsurprisingly still has plenty of differences. In the book, Challenger keeps his experience of the South American expedition vague, whereas in the movie, everyone seems to be well aware of his crazy yarn about living dinosaurs in the Amazon, and as a result, call him a liar because of these claims. In the movie, Edward Malone is still looking for a dangerous assignment in order to prove himself to Gladys, but instead of meeting with the professor alone like he did in the book, he's ordered by his boss to attend the public meeting that Challenger is at to find out more about the scandal. Problem is, journalists are not allowed, given Challenger's hatred for them. At the meeting, however, we meet with Lord John Roxton, and we learn that in this version, Malone and Roxton are already familiar with each other, and with that familiarity, Roxton helps get Malone into the meeting. They go in the meeting, where Challenger is given a chance to defend his previous statements, but instead of defending himself, he doubles down and actually asks for volunteers to accompany him back to the Lost World to prove his accounts true. Professor Summerlee volunteers only because he thinks Challenger is a fake and will find nothing. Roxton, being the sportsman that he is, volunteers as well. And finally, Malone volunteers as he sees this as the perfect opportunity to face danger and prove himself to Gladys. When Challenger asks for Malone's occupation, the young reporter tells the truth and is chased out of the building by the professor. Malone then follows Challenger home and sneaks into his house, you know, as you do when you're trying to get someone's attention, and he proceeds to ask him if he can join this expedition. And of course, this leads to a scuffle, they're broken up by a policeman, Malone refuses to charge Challenger, and Challenger allows the reporter inside the house to fill him in on the expedition. In the movie, Challenger explains to Malone of an explorer named Maple White who discovered a plateau in South America containing prehistoric animals. White's daughter and assistant, Paula, who's also unique to this version of the story, was with her father during the trip but was too ill to venture on the plateau with him. When he didn't return, she came to Challenger for help. However, the professor has had trouble funding the trip on account of the fact that no one believes him and that he's aggressive to people in general. Fortunately, Malone suggests for his newspaper job to sponsor the trip on the condition that they have exclusivity to write about it, as a rescue mission expedition would definitely be a newsworthy headline. Challenger agrees, and soon they're off to South America, where they find the plateau and make camp at the base. The five main characters climb up to the rock structure next to the plateau, while Challenger's assistant, Austin, stays behind at base camp with Zambo, who... oh no... Uh, let's just say my boy Jules Cowles over here fell into some mud and didn't clean himself off for the remainder of this movie. Anyways, they cut down the tree, make it across the gorge, and encounter a brontosaurus that ends up grabbing at the leaves of the fallen tree, causing it to fall down and trapping our characters on the plateau. The dinosaur content in the movie has just as much, if not surpasses, that of the book, as our characters have many encounters with them, including an allosaurus fight with a trachodon before it then goes after a triceratops mother and her young, there's a Tyrannosaurus Rex attack at the camp one night which they're able to scare away using fire, shortly after, the Allosaurus attempts to kill an Agathomas and is not only killed by the large Ceratopsian dinosaur, but literally has its insides ripped out by its horns. This is followed with a T-Rex emerging from the brush and killing the Agathomas before also taking down a Pterosaur. Some of the group later witness the T-Rex attacking a Brontosaurus by the edge of the plateau, which causes the sauropod to fall off the edge down into a lake. And the group is also stalked and meddled with by an ape-man creature. At some point, the group spots some caves that they take refuge and explore in both to stay away from the dangers on the plateau and to try and find Paula's father. However, Roxton comes across some skeletal remains that are revealed to belong to Maple White, much to Paula's dismay. She and Malone, however, have begun to fall in love with each other, as Malone realizes they may never make it back to their old lives, including his life with Gladys. However, after exploring more of the cave system, Roxton is able to find an opening on the wall of the plateau that's closer to the ground, though still a high climb. 
Austin and Zambo make a rope for the rest of the group to be able to use to get down. As Malone goes to fetch Summerlee and Challenger, who went off to study some of the prehistoric fauna, a dormant volcano awakens, causing havoc across the plateau and almost killing our characters. Luckily, they're able to make it back to the cave, where they use rope brought up by Paula's monkey pet, Jocko. They climb down, but not before the ape man tries to pull Malone back up. The ape man is shot, Malone makes it to the ground, and the group is finally out of the lost world. Now that they're off the plateau, Paula doesn't feel right being with Malone since he has a woman waiting for him back in London. As they make their way back, the group discover a brontosaurus stuck in a mud bank. The same one from earlier that had fought against the T-Rex and fell off the edge of the plateau into the water. Challenger takes the live specimen back to London where he plans to show it off to his associates to prove once and for all that his accounts were true. But before he can do that, the brontosaurus ends up escaping from its cage and wreaks havoc across London before making its way towards Tower Bridge. The movie ends with the bridge breaking apart under the weight of the sauropod sending it into the water, where it then makes its way away from civilization. Challenger, though no doubt vindicated, is upset to see his specimen go. Meanwhile, Malone reunites with Gladys, who ended up marrying another man in his absence. But no matter, as this now excuses Malone of any obligations towards her, and he can now be with Paula. 1925's The Lost World would end up becoming a very significant point in not just dinosaur cinema, but cinema as a whole given its technical achievements. It would go on to inspire other popular movies like 1933's King Kong and even Jurassic Park, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. In 1998, the movie was also officially inducted into the National Film Registry by the Library of Congress for its overall significance to the film industry. Trust me, there's plenty more to say about this movie and I plan to one day do like a full-on breakdown of its own history, but for now, I'm gonna leave it here. The Lost World 1926 Often considered as a Lost World parody, The Lost World is a silent comedy short film that was released just the following year after 1925's The Lost World. The short was produced by John Randolph Bray, who would be responsible for another dinosaur film that he made called Gertie the Dinosaur. No, not the 1914 one made by Winsor McKay, but rather the 1950 ripoff with the same name. Bray used to be a freelance cartoonist before trying his hand with animation. That, in turn, must have gotten him closer into the film industry because by 1926, he would release The Lost World, which really didn't have anything in common with the plot of its more popular predecessor. The Lost World revolves around an author who is literally about to kill himself by jumping off a pier before he's stopped by a random person passing by. When asked what his deal is, the author explains that he wrote a great story that no one wants to hear. So the passerby, who happens to be a producer, decides to listen to the author's story to see if it's worth doing anything with for a picture. The story begins with a male-dominant cult on an island called Isle of Moss, ran by a king who feeds his queen to a T-Rex as a sacrifice. Wanting a new queen, the king sends his henchmen to Hollywood to find him a woman. The henchmen make their way over to a Californian beach where they run into a cute blonde named Molly. Along with her, they also run into Molly's admirer, and after a short comedic chase, the men are able to kidnap Molly and take her back to the island by boat. But luckily for her, her admirer is also able to sneak on board. When they reach the Isle of Moss, Molly is prepared for her forced marriage with the king, but is rescued by her admirer. And after a series of comedic events, the story comes to a close when Molly and her lover are attacked by the T-Rex inside a hut, but are saved by a brontosaurus that fights off the carnivore in cartoony fashion before eventually killing it. The lovers are able to get away and the cult is chased back into their caves by the brontosaurus ending the author's story. The producer then asks the artist if he wrote that story all by himself, to which the author says, yes, I and I alone am responsible for it, before being pushed off the pier by the producer in an ending that actually caught me off guard and made me laugh out loud. So yeah, all in all, this movie didn't really have anything to do with The Lost World aside from the play on words title and of course, The Dinosaurs, which were actually made by J.L. Roop, an animator who also apparently worked on The Lost World, though it doesn't look like like he was credited, so whether any of his stuff made it into the final cut isn't completely known. Lost World 1948 Lost World is a 1948 manga made by famous Japanese cartoonist Osamu Tezuka, and it has a very interesting concept despite it being pretty different from Doyle's original story. 
The story is about a group of people who venture to a planet that orbits close to Earth called Planet Mamongo, or Mamongo, I'm not really sure how you pronounce it, which contains prehistoric life roaming around on it. Turns out, this planet was once a part of Earth in the distant past, but was broken off and floated out into space, orbiting back towards Earth every 5 million years. Admittedly, aside from the title of course, it seems that Doyle's story didn't really play too much of a role in the creation of Tezuka's manga. While I wasn't able to find much information on the topic, one site that I did run into apparently recorded a quote from Tezuka that revealed that he didn't even read Doyle's novel before making his Lost World manga. According to the site, the quote reads, As for the title, it has no relation whatsoever to the Conan Doyle novel of the same name. As much the same way as Metropolis, which came later, at the time I hadn't even read Doyle's Lost World. I just thought it was a cool title for some reason, so I partook of it. So yeah, maybe it was pointless to add this to the video, but I guess better safe than sorry. Two Lost Worlds, 1951 Okay, in case you couldn't already tell, there's naturally going to be some examples here that might be a stretch to call Lost World adaptations, or even works that were inspired by the Lost World. But I believe in exceptions, and I will continue to make them regardless of what people say because at the end of the day, this is my video and I can do whatever I want with it. Two Lost Worlds is one of those exceptions because this movie, that has almost nothing to do with dinosaurs, is a far departure from what Doyle's story was, to the point where you could hardly call it well, anything that has to do with The Lost World. Two Lost Worlds takes place in 1830 and focuses on Kirk Hamilton, first mate of the Hamilton Queen ship that carries the cargo he's in charge of overseeing. However, when his ship is attacked by pirates, he's injured in the process, and the captain makes an emergency stop towards a settlement in Queensland, Australia, where Hamilton is forced to stay to recover while the captain and the rest of the crew go off to drop off their cargo, and the first mate will be retrieved upon the captain's return trip. While there, Hamilton makes himself comfortable with the locals, especially with Elaine, the daughter of the man who runs this newly formed settlement. Of course, this seems to cause problems with Elaine's jealous fiancé, Martin Shannon, a rancher who helps run the settlement that seems to be dealing with their own pirate problems. This is more evident after the settlement is attacked one night by said pirate, who also kidnap Elaine and her friend Nancy. Hamilton, who's fallen in love with Elaine, teams up with Shannon and go after the ship leading to a fight that ends up killing most of the men and sinking both vessels. Luckily, a handful of survivors, including Hamilton, Shannon, who was wounded during the fight, Elaine, Nancy, Elaine's younger sister Janice, and a settler named John survived by making it off the ships on a rowboat. Drifting out at sea, the group eventually finds an island that contains prehistoric monsters on it that are actually just reused clips from another dinosaur movie called 1 Million BC from 1940. The island also has an active volcano on it that erupts and kills Nancy in the process. Towards the movie's end, Shannon also succumbs to his wounds, but shortly after, the remaining four are rescued by the captain of the Hamilton Queen, who decided to go searching for Hamilton after returning to Queensland and learning about everything that had happened. Definitely an interesting movie, though not necessarily a good one. That, and at best, this film was maybe somewhat inspired by Doyle's story. Lost Continent, 1951 just like Two Lost Worlds, 1951's Lost Continent doesn't really have much to do with the Lost World aside from clearly being inspired by it. In the movie, the American military launches an experimental atomic rocket that's meant to turn back. However, due to a malfunction, the rocket continues forward and disappears after running out of fuel. So a small team consisting of a few scientists, a couple of pilots, and a mechanic are sent to locate the rocket by plane which leads them to an island that they crash land on after the plane's power goes out. They come across a nearly empty native village after exploring the island for a bit, its only inhabitants being a pair of siblings. The rest of their tribe left after a firebird, as they call it, flew past their village and onto what they describe as the Sacred Mountain. The siblings had stayed to take care of their ill father before he eventually died. The firebird, of course, is referring to the rocket that our group is trying to find. However, the siblings seem terrified of the mountain as they say it's the home of their god. She leads the men to the base of the mountain where they proceed to spend the next, I kid you not, almost 20 minutes of the movie getting up on it. Much like The Lost World, the mountain is actually a plateau containing prehistoric life, only in this movie, it also happens to house a field of uranium as well which is what lured the rocket towards the area. 
As they search for the rocket, the group make their first dinosaur encounter with a hostile brontosaurus that chases one of the men up a tree. The following day, they witness a bloody triceratops fight after a close call trying to go after a couple of the men that had briefly parted from the group. And finally, when rations begin to dwindle, the group resort to shooting down a pterosaur for food. As they try to find their kill, however, they run into the rocket. Unfortunately, it's surrounded by the hostile wildlife, which funnily enough, are just herbivorous dinosaurs. Not once does this movie feature any theropods. A plan is made for a couple of the men to go distract the dinosaurs with gunfire while the rest go towards the rocket to grab the data from within it. Despite their success, one of the men is fatally injured in the process of this plan by a Triceratops. More specifically, the comic relief character of the movie, Willy, who was the mechanic. I actually liked Willy, and the way they show his death is actually kind of creative. As he lays dying on the ground, he asks the sergeant for a cigarette. The sergeant takes out his lighter as well, but the flame suddenly goes out, the movie's way of indicating that Willy had perished. The group bury their friend and make their way down the mountain now that their mission is complete. However, on their way down, the mountain begins to erode from under them, forcing the men quickly down the mountain and off the island by canoe left behind by the native village. The movie ends with the men narrowly escaping out to sea as the island they were just on becomes lost forever. The Lost World Comic 1957 1957's The Lost World is the first of many comic adaptations to the original 1912 book. This comic was made by French artist Remy Borles. I don't even think I pronounced that right. I don't know. Correct me in the comments down below, please. Its initial release was through magazines under the company Mondial Press. Though eventually, a little over 40 years later in 1998, the comic was gathered and re-released as a compendium by Apex Editions. Information about the comic is scarce, but according to one site, it seems the compendium was only limited to 250 copies. The Lost World 1960 1960's The Lost World was the second movie adaptation to Doyle's book which was directed by Irwin Allen, who was no stranger to dinosaurs as he had directed the documentary The Animal World in 1956. He would eventually obtain the option for a movie on The Lost World, though nothing was really done with it at first. It wasn't until just hours before the option's expiration date when Alan's boss made the last minute decision to renew it so that they could make the movie. Eventually, they did, and between itself and the 1925 version, this one takes a much farther departure from the source material. While all four of the original characters make an appearance, including Professor Challenger, Edward Malone, Professor Summerlee, and John John Roxton, were also introduced to new characters including Jennifer and her brother David, who are the children of Malone's boss, boss of a news reporting company. The company is prepared to finance the trip on the condition that Malone tag along to report the story, which Challenger agrees to. Also, in this version, Challenger makes no attempt to hide his claims of dinosaurs on the plateau that he wants to travel to. Nor does he make any mention of Maple White because Maple White doesn't exist in this version, more on that later. Roxton and Jennifer seem to have a romantic history with each other and Malone seems to be going on this expedition for no other reason than his job. They also get to the plateau in a much less complicated manner as they take a helicopter that's piloted by Gomez, who also brings along his partner, Costa. However, not long after they land, the helicopter is destroyed by what Challenger describes as a Jurassic dinosaur. Speaking of the movie's dinosaurs, instead of stop-motion models and animations like the original movie, the 1960s version opts to use live animals with fins, spikes, and sails glued onto them. According to Alan, he was turned away from working with stop motion after the animal world due to how time consuming it was. And in just the previous year, 1959's Journey to the Center of the Earth had used live animals, and it seemed to work out well for them, time-wise of course. Quality for the dinosaurs? Who cares about that? It's not like they're your main fucking stars for a dinosaur movie. Just put some garbage on some reptiles and call it a day. Willis O'Brien was actually brought on to work on this project as well, being credited as the effects technician. And of course, he wasn't at all happy with this decision. According to the dinosaur filmography, O'Brien stated at one point, They claim that the live technique looks smoother, that animation is jerky. They felt it would take too long to animate. I don't agree with them. It takes quite a crew with these reptiles. Despite this, reptiles were used, and we have an alligator with a sail, a monitor lizard with a frill on its head and plates on its back, an iguana with horns, and a baby gecko with horns as well. 
And to top it all off, this movie has the audacity to stick real dinosaur names on these creatures, like Brontosaurus and Tyrannosaurus Rex. Anyways, along with dinosaurs, the group also run into a native woman that they hold prisoner. Back at their base camp inside a cave, they find a journal of a Burton White, which mentions Roxton. It's then revealed that three years prior, Roxton managed to get a hold of a map that led to where he could get up the plateau, which he intended to explore with the intentions of getting diamonds, while the rest of the people he was with did it for more archaeological reasons. Roxton was meant to lead them through radio transmissions and catch up with them later, but ended up ditching the group for personal reasons. As a result, the group went missing, but Roxton's attempt at returning were still for selfish reasons, as he still wants to try and find diamonds and has completely given up hope that the men are still alive. Sometime later, the group is kidnapped by natives who hold them prisoner, but the woman they captured earlier had taken a liking to David and helps them escape. She takes them to Burton White himself, who after three years is still alive, but is the only one out of the entire group that's left. Much to Gomez's dismay, because spoiler alert, his brother was one of the people that went on the expedition and is now dead because of Roxton. White helps the group escape along with giving them some weapons, but stays behind. In the film's climax, the group attempts to cross a lava pool, but are stopped by the diamond-hungry Costa, the angry Gomez, and a dinosaur lizard monster thing that I think is supposed to be a T-Rex, but I don't fucking know. Costa is eaten, Gomez is saved by Roxton, which gives him a change of heart, causing him to sacrifice his life for the group. This act of heroism kills the lizard and helps the group escape with some of the diamonds and even a baby dinosaur that hatches from an egg that Challenger was able to smuggle out of the cave. The Lost World Comic, 1960 during the 50s and 60s, Dell Comics apparently worked on a series of movie tie-in comics, with one of them being on 1960's The Lost World with artwork done by comic artist Gil Kane. From what I've seen, the comic seems to follow pretty closely to the events of the film, with some differences here and there, like this scene of Malone and Jennifer running away from what Challenger described as a brontosaurus, only to be greeted by a quote-unquote dinosaur that didn't appear in the film. The Lost World Comic, 1962. In 1962, another comic book adaptation was made of The Lost World. Though rather than being an adaptation to one of the movies, it was actually an adaptation to the original book. This version of Doyle's book was released in a UK kids comic magazine called Eagle, and it was made by Martin Aitchison, who had made several comics for Eagle in the span of about 11 years. The Lost World ran between March and July of 1962 and details a story that's a bit more faithful to the source material. Of course, because it's a comic, it doesn't spend nearly as much time getting to know our characters. Malone is sent to a lecture hall by his boss to do a report on the contentious Professor Challenger and his stories of witness prehistoric life on a plateau in South America, where he also announces an expedition returning to the location. And of course, you have our three main characters volunteering to go, including Summerlee, Roxton, and Malone. In this version, Challenger doesn't seem bothered by the fact that Malone is a journalist. In fact, he actually welcomes the idea of including a journalist in his adventure straight away. The group make their way to South America and encounter several challenges including hostile natives, venomous snakes, and a surprise ambush from a pterodactyl that swoops down and steals their food. The following day, the group make their way up the adjacent rock structure next to the plateau and cut down a tree to use as a bridge. However, when the tree falls, it lands in a weird position that's just stable enough for our characters to get across. But as Malone makes his way to the other side, the tree loses its grip of the rock structure and falls, almost taking Malone alone with it. Stuck on the plateau, the group make use of their time to explore. They run into a carnivorous dinosaur at night, and they're attacked by a flock of pterodactyls, one of which flies off with Roxton before being shot down with an arrow, indicating human life on the plateau other than our main characters. However, Roxton is nowhere to be found, so the group split up to try and find him. Summerlee and Challenger are kidnapped by a group of eight men, and Malone runs into a tribe of natives that are then chased by a theropod dinosaur before it's shot away by Roxton, who explains the natives seem to view him as a sort of white deity and took him in. The two go after the ape men, who are preparing to throw Summerlee and Challenger off the plateau, but arrive just in time to save them. They manage to get Summerlee, but Challenger is taken and made to be a sacrifice to the theropod dinosaur. Roxton rescues Challenger and are pursued by the dinosaur before another prehistoric monster, no doubt a reference to the one from the 1960s film given its frilled head and plated back, emerges from the brush and fights off the theropod allowing our characters to escape. 
When they all finally meet back with each other, they're taken to the native village on the other side of the plateau, where they meet the tribe's chief, who's wearing attire embedded with diamonds. The chief shows them cave paintings that indicate stories of white gods, which explains the tribe's fascination for them, but also the chief's disdain for them, as he sees their presence as a threat to his own power. It's also revealed that the ape men were the original inhabitants of the plateau while the natives came some time later, meaning there had to be a way off the lost world. While all of this is happening, the ape men gather a pack of large theropod dinosaurs and lead them straight to the native village. This leads to a really cool battle sequence between the natives, the dinosaurs, and the ape men who are targeted by the dinosaurs after the tribes are able to reach higher ground. When the battle finally ends, they're able to capture a live pterodactyl, but our characters are no longer welcomed in the native village, and as a result, they're shown the way off the plateau. Before they depart, the chief hands over his headdress as a form of thank you before the group finally make it out of the lost world. When they reach civilization, they show the public their evidence, which is the pterodactyl they managed to capture that also escapes from the building, likely making its way back home. The comic ends with the men talking of the possibility of funding a proper trip back to the lost world using the diamonds on the chief's headdress that was gifted to them. Overall, this one was a really cool adaptation of the original novel. It felt somewhat faithful to the source material while also doing its own thing. The comic would also be re-released in the following year in a French comic magazine called Pilote. Unmade Lost World Movie from the Mid-1960s during stop-motion animator Jim Danforth's time working for Universal during the mid-1960s, he ran into matte artist Albert Whitlock who saw some of Danforth's dinosaur art. More specifically, it was of a brontosaurus and it seemed like it was concept art to a model that Danforth was making. And this led to a conversation about the Lost World, as Whitlock talked about how he always wanted to do work for a Lost World movie. With that, Danforth attempted to get one off the ground, asking around and pitching the idea to to producers. However, the 1960s film adaptation had left a bad taste in people's mouths. So no one really wanted to go for the idea of remaking The Lost World, at least for that point in time. The Lost World comic 1972. So, in case you couldn't tell, there's going to be a lot of comics on this list. This particular one was made in 1972, and it was published in a kids' magazine called Look and Learn, which specialized in both educational and science fiction articles and stories. The Lost World story was released in 15 parts from between late September to early January, and it was illustrated by Jerry Embleton. From the looks of it, for the most part, it seems like a pretty faithful adaptation to the book with some slight changes here and there that we've pretty much already seen in previous iterations. The Lost World comic 1975 couldn't really find a whole lot of information about this one, but apparently this French comic adaptation of The Lost World was illustrated by Alex Nino. While I don't know exactly how faithful this version was to the source material, the art depicts a much more cartoony style to it. The Lost World Unmade Movie 1990 so I already talked about this example in the second volume of my Dinosaur Movies That Were Never Made series. There's not much information on this Lost World movie that never came to fruition, but from what I can gather in the dinosaur filmography, John Landis was hired as the director, Richard Matheson was hired as the scriptwriter, and Sean Connery was hired for the role of Professor Challenger. According to Landis, the movie was meant to be a traditional adaptation to the original book. He said at one point, We were going to do a very traditional, old-fashioned adaptation. Unfortunately, it was in development at Universal, and when they bought Jurassic Park, they said, We don't want to do The Lost World. Challenger The Lost World Comic 1990 Challenger The Lost World is a French comic adaptation of the classic story. I couldn't really find much on this one either, so I don't know for sure how faithful it was to the book. Though I was able to find some panels here and there of the comic, the story of which was written by André Paul de Chateau, the designs done by Patrice Anahoujis, and the color done by Claire Legrand. The description of the story does say that this version's Lost World actually takes place in the center of Africa rather than South America. The Lost World and Return to the Lost World 1992 The Lost World is a 1992 film adaptation of the novel directed by Timothy Bond. 
immediately it has some noticeable differences, including the introduction of new characters and the absence of old characters. Some of the new characters we're introduced to are Malone's kid friend Jim and female wildlife photographer Jenny Nielsen. What's interesting about this iteration of The Lost World is that they decided to cut out John Roxton's character entirely, though Challenger, Malone, and Summerlee are still here. Why they decided to cut the sportsman out, I'm not really sure, but another huge difference between the book and the movie is the setting, as the mysterious Lost World Plateau is actually based in Africa this time around. A couple of more new characters are introduced including the group's helping hand Pujo and the group's guide and translator Malu. They use climbing equipment to get up the plateau but are double crossed by another one of their guides, Gomez, who was the brother of a man named Pedro that Challenger had killed in self-defense in his previous trek in this region. Pedro had attempted to steal Challenger's belongings leading to the professor to shoot the man dead, and in turn, causing Gomez to leave them for dead up on the plateau. Of course, being a man of science, Challenger takes advantage and explores the area. As a result, our characters encounter Anatosauruses, Summerly falls inside a pterodactyl nest pit, and Malone, Malu, and Jim have a run-in with a carnivorous dinosaur in the woods one evening. When they return to camp in the morning, they see the rest of their friends have been kidnapped. Turns out the plateau is inhabited by two tribes that were once united. However, a portion of the tribe departed from the rest as they began to worship the carnivorous dinosaurs, while the other worshipped the herbivorous dinosaurs. The carnivore worshippers, or the skeleton tribe given their body paint, have kidnapped our characters along with a couple of the members of the herbivore worshippers. The skeleton tribe put leaf made necklaces over their victims and throw one of their rivals over the cliff where his dead body is devoured by a T-Rex. Luckily, Malone, Jim, and Malu are able to cause a distraction and save their friends and the other innocent native, who turns out to be the chief of the herbivore worshippers. The group are taken back to his home where they welcome the newcomers. At one point, a sick baby pterodactyl that they named Percival is introduced to the group, prompting Summerlee to go back to the skeleton tribe to steal some of their plant materials that they used to make the necklaces for their sacrifices. The movie then introduces a really interesting explanation for the dinosaurs still being alive in modern day. Summerlee explains that the sick pterosaur proves his theory of dinosaurs going extinct by plague to be true. The only reason why these dinosaurs on the plateau were still alive was because the plant material they were either feeding on or being fed to held the medicinal components that they needed to survive. Percival is cured of his illness and the conflict between the two rival tribes are solved after Malu kills the leader of the skeleton tribe, causing the rest of them to surrender in peace and reunite with the others. Grateful for everything, the chief leads the group to a passage out of the lost world on the condition that they return should the tribe ever need their help again. On their way home, Challenger has a run-in with Gomez but is able to defeat him, though he doesn't kill him. The group make their way back to London and reveal their evidence to the public in the form of Percival himself. Though this means he's forced to live within the confines of a cage inside a zoo. But the movie ends on a happy note, with our characters releasing the poor pterosaur who likely flew back to his home in the Lost World. The most interesting aspect about this particular Lost World adaptation is the fact that it's the first to have its own sequel. What's stranger is that the sequel came out in the same year as the first one since they were apparently filmed simultaneously. From my guess, it was the plan from the start to have a sequel to this movie, so I guess to save time and funds, they just made both movies while they were on location in Zimbabwe along with reusing all of the dinosaur props from the previous movie and of course using the same cast of characters. The only dinosaur dinosaur prop that's unique to this movie are an ankylosaurus mother and her young. The mother is actually killed in pretty brutal fashion, being wounded by an explosion caused by the bad guys before being put down with a couple of gunshots to the head. The storyline for Return to the Lost World is completely unique, containing very little elements from the original novel. The movie is about the tribe needing the help of their friends, Challenger, Summerlee, Malone, Jenny, Malu, and Jim, after their home is invaded by a group of men led by the antagonist of the movie, Hammond and his henchman Gomez, that are given permission to harvest their land of its oil. However, it's not oil they end up getting. Instead, they inadvertently activate an eruption after drilling into a volcanic deposit. Given the events, our main characters are called to return to the plateau to help the tribe from not just the intruders, but also the volcanic eruption. Luckily, our characters arrive just in time to save the tribe from Hammond and Gomez, which leads to Gomez's death. 
as he's shot by Challenger. Hammond is apprehended, which takes care of one problem, but there was still the issue of the volcano. Challenger then hatches the idea to fight fire with fire and kill the eruption with his unstable, untested explosive materials that he just happened to have on him. However, no one seems confident in the plan except for Challenger. So he goes into the cave system alone to locate the volcanic core to detonate his explosives, while the rest of the group attempt to convince the tribe to evacuate from the plateau to no avail, as the tribe don't want to leave their home. Even if they wanted to, the eruption caused the only way out of the plateau to be blocked by debris, so Challenger's plan is their only hope. However, certain obstacles get in their way, including Hammond's men and Hammond himself. However, the explosives are detonated, and as you'd expect, the plan works and the plateau is saved, for now at least. The Lost World Comic 1993 there's really not a lot I can find on this one, but I ran into the silent monster movie site I mentioned earlier that talks a bit about this specific comic adaptation of The Lost World. Apparently, it featured in a dinosaur-themed newspaper called Dinosaur Times that didn't really last too long as a newspaper as it would eventually transition to a website called The Dinosaur Interplanetary Gazette after only a few issues printed. For how long the comic strip went on for, I'm not entirely sure, but apparently it was illustrated by Gray Morrow and written by Don Krar, who would later be replaced by Bob Madison. Along with that, it seems the comic strip went unfinished and as far as I can see, hasn't been properly released outside of the original publication. So I wouldn't be able to tell you any differences or similarities between this one and the original novel. The Lost World Jurassic Park 1995 Okay, so obviously, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park sequel, The Lost World, is not an adaptation to the classic 1912 story. But also obviously, there was definitely some inspiration at play here. The novel is about Ian Malcolm teaming up with a new group of characters to venture to a new island known as Site B, or Isla Sorna, that the InGen Corporation used as a place to create their dinosaurs before sending them to their biological preserve slash theme park on Isla Nublar. Because InGen is no longer in operation by this point and the island had been abandoned, the dinosaurs have taken it back and are now roaming free, leading to all sorts of trouble for our characters. Again, not really an adaptation, but I couldn't not add it to the list given its reference and overall popularity. And just to be clear, I'm only including Crichton's novel for this list, as obviously the Lost World Jurassic Park title would be used for the movie adaptation, video games, and plenty of its own comic lines, and I don't intend to include any of them here. Considering their source material is Crichton's novel, I think that's the only one I need to include. Despite the reference to Doyle's story, Crichton actually made note of the title during an interview where he said, It's a reference to Conan Doyle, one of his more pulpy stories. It's a Professor Challenger story, and it's actually not a very good book. But it's a wonderful title, and it's about an expedition to a place where there are dinosaurs. I guess he wasn't a fan of the book, but it should be noted that Crichton did also write an essay on Doyle that was used as an introduction for a re-release version of Doyle's original story, where he commended the late author for creating an influential piece of literature that helped kickstart a whole genre of stories that's still used today. The Lost World comic, 1996. Oh hey look, another Lost World comic, what a surprise. This one was made by Millennium Comics, and what it contains, I don't fully know, as there's not much information about this comic either. What I do know for sure is that it was written and illustrated by Donald Marquez. I was also able to find a synopsis of the story on an eBay listing, though I don't know for sure how completely accurate this is. So take it with a grain of salt. Based on the description, the story sounds pretty faithful to the source material, with minor differences here and there, and the inclusion of a new character, a female named Murata. The story also ends with our four main characters, Challenger, Malone, Summerlee, and Roxton, deciding to go back to the Lost World together as a group to obtain more proof. Dinosaur Summer 1998 not so much an adaptation, but rather a continuation of the original Lost World story, Dinosaur Summer by science fiction author Greg Bear 
takes place 50 years after the events of the original story. It's actually an interesting concept because the way Bear approaches it is pretty unique for a dinosaur story. Basically, after the discovery of dinosaurs on the plateau all those years ago, the public exploited them by taking them from their homes and using them as targets for hunting and pitting them against each other for entertainment. As things got out of control, the Venezuelan government disallowed access to the plateau for the public, and all of the dinosaurs that were off of the plateau had perished, save for a group of them used for a circus show that was going out of business. As a result, a group of our characters must return them to their original home. I haven't gotten a chance to read the story myself, but the concept alone sounds really cool, and on top of that, the story also includes real-life figures prominent to the history of the Lost World and the movie industry as a whole, including Willis O'Brien, Ray Harryhausen, Miriam C. Cooper, and Ernest B. Shodasak. The Lost World Play, 1998. The Lost World actually has quite the lineup of play adaptations. This particular one was an audio drama recited by the cast of the Star Trek TV series. The drama was produced by Alien Voices and released on the Sci-Fi Channel on July of 1998. For the most part, the story follows pretty closely to that of Doyle's book, though there are noticeable differences. One of the biggest ones is the fact that Professor Summerlee is a woman this time around. Aside from that, everything follows as normally, at least at first. Summerlee wants to prove Challenger wrong of his statements of prehistoric life existing on a plateau in South America, Malone wants to prove himself to Gladys, and Roxton wants to guide the group safely through the South American jungles. They travel to their destination, climb up the rock structure next next to the unclimbable plateau, make a tree bridge, and get double-crossed by their guide, Gomez, who strands them on the plateau as a form of revenge against Roxton, who had rightfully killed his brother in a previous conflict. Roxton shoots Gomez down the rock structure, and the group venture into the jungles of the plateau, where they run into a brontosaurus feeding on some vegetation before it's attacked by a megalosaurus. They get away from the area and find a large tree that Malone climbs to gain a better view of the plateau. Up there, he encounters a strange ape man that gets away too quickly for Malone to get a good look at. That night, Malone decides to take a walk towards the central lake he saw from the tree and spots a herd of unnamed sleeping dinosaurs, along with a couple of armadillo-like creatures, likely glyptodons or dodicoruses, that make their way down to the lake as well. Suddenly, the two animals are snatched from land and dragged into the water by a predatory animal from the lake that was too swift for Malone to identify. On his way back home, he's chased by a theropod dinosaur through the jungles before he falls into a man-made trap, a pit with spikes sticking out from the bottom of it meant to impale anything that falls in. By the time he gets out of the pit and makes his way back to camp, it's morning and he makes the terrifying discovery that his colleagues were gone. Roxton then appears and tells Malone that they had been kidnapped by the ape men that morning and only he had managed to get away. The two gather their rifles and make their way back to save Summerlee and Challenger, along with a group of natives that live on the other side of the plateau that seem to be in a tribal war with the ape men. The rescue mission is a success, and the grateful natives take the group back to their village, where they plan out a greater attack on the ape men, much to Summerlee's dismay, as she thinks the ape men were just trying to survive like the natives were. But considering this may be their only way off the plateau, she goes along with it anyways. They successfully exterminate the ape men, and shortly after, Summerlee Summerlee is gifted the tree bark map with the way off the plateau by one of the grateful natives. Oh yeah, in this version, Malone and Summerlee end up falling for each other and pull a complete 180 on Gladys. See, where it's usually Gladys in these adaptations that marries another person during Malone's absence, Malone ends up marrying Summerlee on their way back to London, completely taking Gladys by surprise. Who deserves it anyways, because it's obvious she just wanted Malone at this point for the glory. Anyways, the group presents their evidence, a pterodactyl that Roxton caught for Challenger, that gets loose out of the building and flies back to its home in South America. The story ends with Roxton revealing diamonds he found on the Lost World and sharing the fortune with his friends. The Lost World, 1998 this cheaply made-for-TV movie version of The Lost World has several major differences between itself and the source material. The plateau in this version is based in Mongolia, the story is set in the 1930s, and the characters get to the top of the plateau by hot air balloon that gets attacked by pterosaurs. As far as our characters go, instead of Edward Malone, there's Arthur Malone. Challenger looks nothing like his book counterpart. Roxton just sounds like an absolute asshole in this one, as from the sounds of it, he serves as the movie 
movie's antagonist. And as far as Summerlee goes, there doesn't seem to be anything too out of place for him, except of course that he and Roxton end up dying on the plateau. Summerlee is eaten by a T-Rex and Roxton accidentally falls off the plateau. For Malone, he ends up staying trapped on the plateau after the rest of the group make it off. This movie also includes a few new characters as well, including Maple White's daughter Amanda and the group's guides. As far as the dinosaurs and prehistoric animals go, there's pterosaurs, brontosaurus, raptors, T-Rex, triceratops, some sort of underground crocodile thing, and probably some other stuff that I'm missing. I'll admit, I didn't get a chance to watch this one, unfortunately, though I kind of want to now, even though most reviews I've seen for this movie have been pretty low. If there's anywhere I can watch or get this movie, let me know. It's one that I want to actually get my hands on and watch one of these days. It looks pretty interesting. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World TV Show 1999 the Lost World series started off as a TV movie pilot that features our usual characters, Challenger, Malone, Summerlee, and Roxton, but also introduces a new one named Marguerite, who goes along with the men after offering to finance the trip to the Amazon jungles in South America. Fun fact, the guy who plays Summerlee in this version, Michael Sinelnikov, also played Summerlee in the previous 1998 version that I just talked about. The group make their way up the plateau via hydrogen balloon and encounter all sorts of one wonders and dangers including a carnivorous plant, bloodthirsty dinosaurs, and a new character named Veronica, who's lived on the plateau since she was a child, surviving on it with the help of the Zanga tribe. The movie also ends with the group still stranded on the plateau, as the idea was to turn the movie into a TV series to continue the story with. The producers were successful, and the show ended up running for a total of three seasons, 22 episodes in each one, before it was eventually cancelled for budget reasons. Well, this video has gone on for a while. I think I'll end it here and continue it in another part. Before I end this video, I want to thank everyone who joined the Patreon, including Gambit Vamp, Greasy Pulsating Frog, Inquisitor Zarius, James Franklin, Darwinius, and Studio DM Wing. I appreciate you guys helping out the channel, and thank you to everyone else for watching this video. Part 2 will be out soon. Until then, thank you all so much for watching, and please, have a nice day.